number five, The Visitor. And get your tissues out, this one will make you cry. It does to me every time. <laughs> and not just me. We begin with Captain Sisko dying. This really is sort of an alternate future episode where we find out what happens when Jake Sisko has to grow up without his father. And Jake Sisko has always been kind of a pathetic non-character, so things don't go well for him. I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything. Just listen. Interesting bit of trivia, that's actually Garrett's daughter. Well, the actor who plays Garrett's daughter in this role. Of course, it fits that one of the best Jake episodes has to be Jake played by someone else. The always awesome Tony Todd. We're going to get a second. Jack. Besides being an emotional as crap story, as emotional as the phrase emotional as crap can be, we also get to see an interesting alternate future. And interestingly enough, some of the things turned out better than in the real future timeline that we'll end up seeing. You, you okay there, off screen Kim? I will be in a minute. Number four, The Way of the Warrior. This was the two episode TV movie premiere that brought us Worf and reinvigorated the series. This really is almost a flawless movie. We begin the episode with the crew trying to worry about how to deal with shape-shifting infiltrators and suddenly we find out there's another threat to deal with, the Klingons. Again with the Klingons. This launched the series long Klingons are the enemies again story arc that changed everything in Star Trek. First it was the Kardashians. Then it was the Dominion. Now it's the Klingons. And yet again prove that Deep Space Nine has the cojones to actually change things up. This was the first time a regular from one series became a regular on another. Yeah, O'Brien was kind of a recurring guest star, but he wasn't a regular. Not the beginning of the episode credits regular. And of anyone to import from TNG, other than Data maybe, Worf was probably the best. Nice hat. And of course, as is fitting with DS9 and their willingness to actually have internal conflict, Worf didn't get along with everyone very well. At least at first, and some people for the rest of the show. So much that even in the show's finale, Quark's big relief that they're going was more for Worf than it was for Odo even. I like that Worf didn't just come on and outdo everyone and everything. Some things Worf could do better than the people who did it before, such as Dax as being our Klingon person. Worf better be able to be a better Klingon than Dax. But he can't do security on the station like Odo can. Oh, and I have to say, especially for a TV budget, the action scenes in this show are freaking amazing. They're better than the action in some of the original universe Star Trek movies, the later ones at least. If you haven't seen this, you should appreciate it even if you don't know anything about Deep Space Nine. As long as you like sci-fi in general, you should appreciate The Way of the Warrior. It's a great movie. It's over. For now. Number three, duet. Back to the occupation again, and this one even more brutal than things past, believe it or not. One of the Kardashians who served at one of the death camps on Bajor during the occupation turns up on the station. He is, of course, immediately thrown into prison. Please, let me conduct this investigation. And thus begins the Silence of the Lambs two-man play between Kira and him. There are twists back and forth, and I'm not going to ruin for you because that's a huge part of the appeal of the episode. Both of these actors are really nailing their parts, and it's amazing. Again, I don't want to spoil things, but the essence of it comes down to, if you encountered a Nazi war criminal, what would you do? What if they were completely unrepentant? What if they were repentant? What if they were a low-level functionary who worked at one of these camps? What if they were the commander of the entire camp? What if it was something in between? Would that affect things one way or another? You're insane. Oh, no, no, Major. <laughs> you can't dismiss me that easily. I did what had to be done. Are you still a human being if you can do inhuman acts? If you were one of the victims, can anything you do in reprisal be an inhuman act? At the risk of sounding repetitive, there's no easy answer to this one either. It's like you took the terrible tragedy of things past and combined it with the unbelievable gut-wrenching power of the visitor, and you'd get... Duet. I wonder how many others like our healer still out there. Still free, unpunished. You know, I can't really make any jokes about this episode, so instead enjoy this. And this one says, it's hilarious that I farted after eating Taco Bell. 
Uh, no, wait, I need to go to the hospital. Number two, Deep Space Nine the movie. What is that, you ask? I'm glad you asked. That is my own personal term for the seven episode arc starting from Call to Arms through A Time to Stand, Rocks and Shoals, Sons and Daughters, Behind the Lines, Favor the Bold, and Sacrifice of Angels. SF Debris calls this the Dominion War arc, which I disagree with because I think that's a little flawed. You might as well call it the Gul Dukat arc or the Weyun arc or something like that. That was only a small part of the entire Dominion War. It is the beginning of the Dominion War, however. And as if kicking off an interstellar war that would last two seasons isn't big enough, our main crew are kicked off the station. Three months of bloody slaughter, and what have you got to show for it? Not a damn thing. Engage, retreat, engage, retreat. Just once, I would have liked to have gotten a look at their backs. Chief, that's enough. At least all the Starfleet crew, all the non-Starfleet people, except for Garrick, get to stay on the station, and suddenly we have a split timeline, and we're on the station, we're controlled by Dukat and Wayun and Damar, and Kira, Odo, and Quark, and all the others have to deal with life under their occupation of the Dominion. Meanwhile, we have Sisko, Dax, Worf, all the others combining together and trying to beat the Dominion back and retake their home. This is amazing to watch if you see it on DVD. And then unfortunately there's no way to go back in time, but if you were actually watching this as it aired, it was unreal. They had shaken everything up. This would be like if Voyager, in Basics, when they lost Voyager, didn't get it back at the end of the episode, but actually spent several episodes trapped on that planet, while the people on Voyager had to deal with the ship being held under enemy control. By the way, that would have been a good idea and they should have done that. They would have beat Deep Space Nine to that paradigm shift if they had actually had the balls to do it. No, no, no. The only captain with sufficiency of balls is... Well, it's not the captains, that's the problem. Yeah, it's yeah. the writers and, the, yeah. and Berman. There's too much about this seven-episode arc to even sum up. You just gotta watch it for yourself and see what happens. Yeah, Sons and Daughters is kind of weak, but even then, it's not terrible. <laughs> and, though they did eventually hit the reset button and Cisco and company got back on the station, shock of all shocks, I know, since many of the episodes that I've listed already take place on the station after this, Still, some permanent changes came about from this. Character was in a different place. Relationships changed. Some people actually died. And of course, the Dominion War was on. And that's nothing to sneeze at. Been sneezing. Off and on, the doctor's giving me something. After this arc ended, even episodes of Deep Space Nine that weren't about the Dominion War still had the Dominion kind of clouding over it all. Call it the Dominion War arc, Deep Space Nine the movie, or whatever you want, but this seven episode arc is one of the best moments of all Star Trek. I look forward to it. And the number one episode of Deep Space Nine, of course... The Romulans. In the Pale Moonlight. Uh, what, what can I say? This is, this is absolute awesome Star Trek. This is the opposite of what Gene Roddenberry tried to trap Star Trek into being, and Star Trek is far better for, as a result of having this. We begin with Cisco trying to draw an enemy into their own war. We're right in tune with the Prime Directive here, aren't we? He aligns himself with Garrick, the only person who can get this job done, and finds himself drawn further and further into compromise and sin and evil in order to bring an end to an even greater evil, the war with the Dominion. This is like all the ethical dilemma talk we've been talking about previously in one episode, focused and condensed. People are dying out there every day. Entire worlds are struggling for their freedom. And here I am, still worrying about the finer points of morality. This is about one good man trying to figure out how to do the right thing and what the right thing is. Is the right thing to do nothing and follow his principles? Is the right thing to do terrible things, all the way up to and including murder? Is it worth the cost of his own conscience to save lives? I don't know about you, but I'd call that a bargain. Yeah, Garrick, we, we know what you think. You, you've made it pretty clear on your view of ethics. And the comedy subplot doesn't exist because this is actually a well-written episode. Okay, we do have this moment. It's a fake. But then 7 of 9 turned the other 90 degrees and he saw there were two fakes. In the pale moonlight. I'm not quite sure other than the dark bleak tone what the title has to do with it. But it's an amazing episode and I can let go an odd title. But that isn't fair. You can't keep me here against my will. I haven't done anything wrong. We had an agreement. 
Frank. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. This deal is getting worse all the time. And there you have it. My picks for the 10 best Deep Space Nines. Were there others? Oh yeah! I Again, just like with TNG, I had 10 more episodes already listed as possibilities that Offscreen Kim and I had to sort through. And it was not an easy task, was it? No, we had to make some hard choices to get down to these 10. Sure, I haven't mentioned yet that Deep Space Nine is my favorite Star Trek series. And if you haven't seen that much Deep Space Nine or any Deep Space Nine, I'd recommend checking it out. Start with these episodes. There are a few bad ones. Any TV show is going to have its crap. But I'd say proportionately, Deep Space Nine has the least amount of crap to the most amount of gold. Gold is good. In fact, I kind of predict I'm going to have this opposite problem when I eventually get down to the top 10 Enterprise episodes. Because there's not that much good to sort through in that show. There is some good, and I'll probably find 10 episodes, but it's going to be a challenge. But to put this to the test, let's try out one of those good episodes of Enterprise next time. YouTube gave this a ban, so Matt and I hatched a plan. The end credits, we would edit just because we can. Instead, here's a new song. Toys for Boys! So the credits go on. My boy Shaska. It's public domain. You can't complain. We can't be happy with that. What's the deal with saying we steal? It's fair use. We give them their dues. If it's so bad, you block our reviews. Why link up with iTunes? You make your money there. So if you're hearing this song, YouTube claimed we done wrong. The song title is still vital right near the end. You'll see what could have been. It was fun. If we just talked like friends. For no one. Instead of discussion, you went for expulsion. That's why this tune has gone on. What more can I say? YouTube gets their way. The old music, we won't use it. Copyright wins. They prevent their loss. We repost past us. No copywriting means no more fighting. I hope you enjoyed what was banned. What's the deal with saying we steal? It's fair use. We give them their dues. If it's so bad, you block our reviews. One link up. I too. Well, that's a waste of doubt. YouTube gave this a ban, so Matt and I have to plan. The end credits, we would edit just because we can. Instead, here's a new song. Toys for Boys! So the credits go on. By Boris Shoska. It's public domain, you can't complain. Who can't be happy with that? It's public domain, you can't complain. Who can't be happy with that? Are you happy now, YouTube? I know that's hypocritical for someone who just said he doesn't want to give away spoilers and... Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Let's try that again. <laughs>